One of the things parents are told to teach their kids, if you're in trouble, call 911. Well, in the story you're about to see, a veteran police detective's daughter who had been kidnapped did what she had been taught. She called 911. So did her husband. So did horrified witnesses, all thinking help would be on the way. They were wrong. Here's Dennis Murphy. It was bad enough that it happened at all, the horrible thing. But doubly shocking for a West Florida community that no one was able to stop it. The young mother, abducted from her home, driven down busy roads, winding through residential neighborhoods in broad daylight, screaming for her life. 911, where's your emergency? People saw her for sure. 911 centers lit up, including one call from a driver giving play-by-play of a nightmare of a crime in real time. He's going slower than I am, which is not right. Something's going on. And even one call from the victim herself, who was able to put out an alert as her kidnapper was at the wheel. Call 911. That's what we're all trained to do, isn't it? For them, so we blew it. And I say we because I'm part of that sheriff's office. The tragedy of it is huge. The, uh, the senselessness of it is huge. Young Denise Amber Lee never wanted to be known as anything but a loving mom and devoted wife. Oh my goodness. She was a 21-year-old truly happily married woman. She met her future husband, Nate Lee, in high school. He hung with the cool kids, the ball players. Denise was more the studious type, a bookworm and math ace. When she finally overcame her shyness senior year and was bold enough to ask out the guy who'd caught her interest, they both learned that opposites really did attract. One of the main things about Denise was she was, she was pretty quiet. Um, she just wasn't a very outgoing person. She actually talked to me first. And uh, I always thought that was the most ironic thing ever because, you know, as quiet as she was and people find out that she's the one that approached me. It's like being the girl asked the guy to dance. It's like, man, I should have just known right there, you know, that, you know, she's the one. Three weeks after their first date, the couple marked Valentine's Day together with a pledge of what was to come. It was kind of awkward because, you know, we had just met and, you know, Valentine's Day was already there and we both didn't know what, you know, Hmm. you know, what we should do. We're falling in love. I ended up getting her just a little probably $40 uh, ring with a heart on it. Denise never took that ring off, and not long after, she got another one when Nate asked her to marry him. Just everything about her was perfect, and we hit it off right from the start, and we ended up uh, starting a beautiful family. Noah came along first, then Adam a couple of years later. Denise had her hands full raising children, so she put off getting her college degree. Nate, meanwhile, was juggling three jobs to make ends meet. There was way more love in their young household than money. We were going through what most people would say some tough times. You know, we had two little kids and we were young. Money wasn't necessarily on our side. It didn't phase us. We were, we knew we were going to be fine and we knew we were, you know, going to grow old together. They'd rented a house in Northport, Florida, a bedroom community 40 miles south of Sarasota. It was close to both their parents, but in a mostly rural setting that appealed to them. Denise's father, Rick Goff, a police sergeant, wasn't entirely comfortable with the feel of the subdivision, a little like a new construction ghost town after the sizzling housing market had sputtered. Were you worried about the house being out in the sticks? Yes. As soon as my, myself and my mother saw it, we go, we're not real happy about this house out here. But it's brand new, three bedroom, two bath house, real cheap rent. And back then, I mean, that's what they could afford. The quiet, partly built community suited Nate and Denise just fine. A perfect safe haven, they thought, for their growing family. At least until the afternoon of January 17, 2008. That day started off routine. It was drizzling outside as Nate left for his job as an electric meter reader. Denise was home with the boys. They checked in with each other periodically on their cell phones. When do you think the last time was that you talked to her? It was 11.09. I have the phone records, and it was only about a five-minute conversation. We were just talking about, you know, what we normally talk about, and uh, I remember asking her that morning to make sure you open the windows so we don't, you know, turn the air off, save some money, and uh, she said she already had. Nate didn't get a chance to call again until he got off work at 3 that afternoon. 
The phone rang, but there was no answer. Unlike Denise to be out. It took me about 25 minutes to get home from there, and I ended up calling eight times in that 25 minutes. You wondering? I didn't start getting nervous until I turned on our street. As he was pulling into his driveway, he noticed right away the windows, the ones Denise said she'd opened, were now shut. Inside, he found his sons, six-month-old Adam and two-year-old Noah, lying together in a crib. Denise was nowhere to be found. Had you ever known her to leave the children alone? No, no, no. That that is. So when do you start to freak? I I, I started freaking about then. I, I I and then I looked at the windows. I noticed it was hot in the house, and I noticed the windows were pushed down, but they weren't shut and latched. They were just like pushed down, like somebody pushed them down in a hurry. Bad sign. Denise's cell phone and keys were lying on a chair. Wherever she'd gone, she'd left in a hurry. Nate called 911. Northport Emergency. Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm-hmm. I just got home from work, and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house, and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. That 911 call made at 3.29 p.m., would be the first of many made that day related to Denise's disappearance. They asked me, was her money missing, this and that, and any sign of forced entry, and, and everything looked normal. It's just the only thing that wasn't normal was the fact that, obviously, Denise wasn't there. The next obvious person to call, his father-in-law, Rick, who happened to be a 25-year veteran of the Sheriff's Department in neighboring Charlotte County. Rick, it turned out, had also been trying to get a hold of Denise that day. He'd left a message inviting them all over to dinner. When he saw Nate's cell phone number pop up, he figured it was the kids calling back. And I go, hey, you guys want to come over and uh, eat? That's the first thing I ask him as soon as he called. He goes, I can't. Denise is missing. It's the first you're hearing this. And I'm like, going, what? And I go, Nate, you got to explain what, what you mean by that. And um, he says, I'm telling you, she's missing. She's not in the house. Rick knew firsthand how law enforcement tends to look at spouses reported suddenly missing, skeptically. He was intent that late afternoon on convincing the Northport police who were running the investigation that this missing person report was different, and they needed to hit it immediately. And I go, listen, if nothing else, I know my daughter. Can we, like, get my helicopter and my dogs out here right across a different jurisdiction? I go, I can have them out here, no, no problem. I already called my people, my chief and stuff, and they're all... Anything I need. What are you allowing yourself to think at this point? I knew she was, something happened to her bad. When police got to the Lee residence, they started knocking on doors and got their first big tip of the day from a neighbor. I was by myself the whole time, so I I kept thinking it could have been me, you know, people would have stopped here. Jennifer Eckert was staying with relatives in the house next to the Lees. She told police she'd seen a white male sitting in a dark green Camaro parked in Denise's driveway at around 2.30 p.m., just one hour before Nate had arrived home. I came outside, and he sat there for, I'd say, a good 15 minutes. And so I went back inside, and then about 10 minutes later, he left. By 5 p.m., an hour and a half after Denise was reported missing, police had the description of a suspect and vehicle and issued a regional BOLO, be on the lookout alert. But it was the next lead in the case, a stomach-churning 911 call that would confirm their worst fears. We just wanted to verify that was her voice and made sure it was what we thought it was. And uh, first thing was her screaming. It was Denise Lee, his daughter. 